So, what did we say last day? Last day, first of all, we got tired of writing that square root thingy. We said, it turns out there's an abbreve for that. I said it's called the Lorentz factor. You don't need to memorize that. But the abbreviation for the square root of 1 minus v uh, over c all squared is a Greek letter gamma. We call it the Lorentz fact factor. And so I started writing the time dilation equation as t0 over the little gamma thing. It was less writing. And then, Kenta, we asked ourselves, why don't we notice relativity in our everyday lives? And we found even on a jet fighter going very fast, our calculator gave us a time dilation figure of one. So it couldn't even track the time dilation. When we started looking at the Earth moving around the sun or the sun moving through the solar system, we got answers, but they were pretty negligible. Derek, you can get this later. Don't worry. It was only when we started to look at particle accelerators that we started to notice there was a significant difference. We talked a little bit more about different ways to travel through time. We will talk in just a few minutes about how to travel, maybe possibly travel backwards in time. But then we talked about length contraction. We said it turns out another consequence of the speed of light being a constant is not only does it mess around with time, it messes around with distances in the direction of travel. We said that if an object is moving past you, or if you're moving really fast past the object, you would see the object shrunken down in the direction of travel. Let me give you an example. Look up, please. If you were traveling past the Earth, the faster you went, the smaller the Earth would be in the direction of travel. As you went faster and faster, assuming you're traveling to the left or to the right, doesn't matter, in the direction of travel, you would find that the Earth would look like this. And not only look like this, in your universe, every experiment that you would do would say that's what the Earth looked like. Any experiment you tried to run about the distance from each side of the equator to the side of the equator, anything like that, you would get that as your answer. Because in your reference frame, that's how long the Earth is. Because as far as you're concerned, the Earth is what's moving past you. Now, the Earth would also see your spaceship all short and stubby as well. And we said there was an equation for it, it turned out. The equation for it was really similar to the time dilation equation. Except, uh, ooh, the square root was next to the L0, not underneath the L0. L0 was the original mass or length at rest, and L was the relativistic length, which was shorter. We did a few examples. We revisited our distance time travel question, sorry, our distance space travel question, and we said this explains why when they measure the distance in light years, they get a different answer. It's because space time itself is contracting in front of it. And we paused right here. So I promised you the possibility of a method to travel into the past. Here it is. Put your pencils down. Look up. Einstein's general theory of relativity describes gravity in terms of warps and curves in space and time. And it's a time part that shows us that a certain kind of time travel is allowed by the equations of the general theory of relativity. Let me describe how that goes. So imagine that we have a region of space, and we've got a spaceship. And to keep track of time, we're going to put a clock on the ship and a corresponding one back on Earth. And now we're going to go on a journey. We're going to take the ship and go to the edge of a black hole. Careful not to fall over the edge, so we just hang out near the edge of the black hole. And Einstein tells us that time elapses more slowly in the presence of a strong gravity field, a strong gravitational potential. That's the time dilation that was happening if you've ever seen the movie Interstellar. How many of you have seen the movie Interstellar? Okay, there, there's a scene where the spaceship, come back here, video, where the spaceship, uh, the, the occupants land on a planet, and when they return back to their patriot, their, their partner who was in the space, spaceship left, left behind them, it's been like, what, 25 years or something, because really, he's almost gone crazy from loneliness. 
gravity kanta also distorts time. So this is not special relativity, this is general relativity. But I have had some someone ask me, hey, Mr. Do it, can you travel into the past? Wait for it. Which means when the ship comes back, there's a time difference between the two clocks. So here, the spaceship has traveled into the future. The spaceship's clock says 2050, but they arrive back on Earth at 2080. They traveled 30 years into the future. You can do that with special relativity map by traveling really fast, or you can do it with general relativity by being near a large gravitational field. That part isn't controversial. In this case, a 30-year time difference between them. So if a person gets out of the ship and revisits with his or her friends on Earth, that person will find that their friends are 30 years older relative to the amount that he or she has aged. For this person, it's 2050. Everyone on Earth says it's 2080. That is time travel to the future, courtesy of general relativity, and in this case, time spent near the edge of a black hole. This is not at all controversial. Everyone who understands general relativity agrees that, at least in principle, this is how things work. The deep question, though, is, what about getting back? Can you travel back in time? And the thing is, we do not know the answer to that question. Most of us think it's not possible. But it's interesting that there are some proposals that have been put forward for how you just might be able to travel back in time. Right? So here's one that doesn't violate our currently understood laws of physics. Let me describe one of them to you. It involves the idea of what's known as a wormhole. We may have encountered that in other settings. A wormhole is just a tunnel through space that acts like a shortcut. So if you want to go from this location to this location, you can go the long route on the outside, or you can go the short route through the wormhole itself. Now let's rerun that little scenario of a rocket going to the edge of a black hole, but now in the presence of a wormhole. So we bring in a rocket ship, imagine it can tow the mouth of a wormhole toward the edge of a black hole. And if we do that, we'll find just as we did a moment ago, that time elapses more slowly near the edge of a black hole than far away. So if the ship then returns to the vicinity of Earth, by the time it gets back to its starting point, there'll be a time difference between the two clocks. Again, in this case, a 30-year time difference just as we found before. Now notice, for the moment, the wormhole hasn't really played any role. It just went along for the ride. What we're now going to do is analyze exactly the same situation, but take the perspective of looking through the wormhole itself to see how time hooks up through the wormhole from one opening to the other. So let's do exactly the same experiment. Take that wormhole opening, tow it to the edge of a black hole. But now what we're going to do, as I mentioned, is look through the wormhole itself. And the math shows that the two clocks at each opening of the wormhole, when viewed through the wormhole itself, agree with one another. There is no time difference between them. And that's quite interesting because it means that when this rocket ship goes back to the vicinity of the Earth, if we now consider the two clocks, the one at this wormhole opening and the clock at that wormhole opening, those two clocks will agree with one another. So what we've done is we've looked at one and the same situation from two different perspectives. The first perspective was looking at how time hooks up outside of the wormhole, where we found a 30-year time difference. And the second perspective looked at how time hooks up through the wormhole, where we found no time difference at all. Jazz, you see it? Okay. So what does this mean? It means that it's in theory possible to leave the Earth. The Earth is the yellow time. What time is it? What year is it on Earth right now, Amber? 2000 and what? And if you went this way in real space to the other end of the wormhole, now you'd be down here, and then you went through the wormhole, you would arrive back on the Earth, but in what year? That would be a way to travel 30 years backwards in time. So Matt's going, oh, well. Now, first of all, we don't even know that wormholes exist. 
They're satisfied by Einstein's equations, but we haven't seen one. Secondly, we don't know if you could tow one near to a black hole. I suspect that once we learn enough physics to actually do something like this, we'll have learned new laws of physics that prevent us from traveling backwards in time. We physicists suspect the universe just won't allow it because all of the paradoxes that would ensue, right? What if you prevented your grandparents from meeting, then you would never have been born, but how could you have prevented your grandparents from meeting that? all the weirdness. So we suspect traveling backwards in time, probably the universe will step in and say, yeah, no, you're not. But that's a valid method that doesn't violate any of our current laws of physics. It's pretty out there, towing a black hole near a black hole, but the math works. It gets weirder, but cooler. Big pencils up. Next page on our lesson. Everybody got it okay? Okay, you found it? It gets even stranger, but cooler. Another consequence of special relativity, so time slows down for a moving object, lengths contract for a moving object, masses increase for a moving object. As objects speed up, there is an increase in mass. And this is governed by this equation, which can also be written using the Lorentz factor as m equals m0 over that little gamma symbol. What's M0? M0 is the same idea as L0. It's the o original mass at rest. Ryan, if you're at rest, what's your speed exactly as a number? So M0 is the o original mass at speed 0. And M is what we call the relativistic mass. And you can put in brackets larger, heavier. The faster an object travels, the more its mass increases. So let's do a couple on our calculator really quick just to practice with this. Suppose we, an object had a mass of 10 kilograms at rest. What would its mass be if it was traveling at, oh, I also gave you, I think, this equation on the back of your green sheet, yeah? The m equals m0 something something equation. So make sure you know where it is. Okay. Uh, Carter, which mass is example four asking me to find m or m0? So M0, they must have given me M0. Carter, what's M0? Okay. And so it's going to be M equals M0 divided by the gamma function. It's going to be 10 divided. Oh, Carter, can I go? Do you see? Do you see? Do you see? What do you see? No, sadly. So it's going to be the square root of 1 minus 2.5 times 10 to the 8th divided by 3 times 10 to the eighth. Don't forget the square. Now, Carter, I said I can't go do you see, but can I go do you 10 to the eighth? Do you 10 to the eighth? Yeah, I can cross those out at least. So if you all want to get out your calculator, I know it should be heavier. So if I did this wrong, I got a smaller answer. It's going to be 10 divided by the square root of 1 minus bracket 2.5 divided by 3 close bracket, squared, close bracket. Now 2.5 times 10 to the 8th, pretty fast. An appreciable fraction of the speed of light. I get 18.1, uh, yes? Almost twice as heavy, but not quite. Peter, how fast are we going in B? You know what? If you can, try just backspacing and see if you can replace what's inside the brackets with a 0.98 and just delete everything else. It'll save you some typing, I think. Yeah, that's OK. Otherwise, it's going to be 10 divided by the square root of bracket 1 minus 0.98 squared. But if you're lazy, you can just backspace and edit. You get uh, 50.3 kilograms.
What about at 99% of the speed of light? Again, see if you can just backspace edit and change the 8 to a 9. And we're good. I get 70.9 kilograms. When I first typed these notes up about seven years ago, the fastest that we got in anything was at the Large Hadron Collider, and it was 0 0.999999991. See, it's eight nines and a one. Try that one in your calculator. What will this 10 kilogram mass have a relativistic mass of? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and a one squared. Did you get 74,540? Eight nines and, and a one squared. I, I think recently, because the, they shut the uh, Hadron Collider down for a couple of years to beef up the magnets. I think it just started up a few months ago. And I think now they're getting stuff going faster than that. But I'd have to go double check the, their web page. Is it, is it 74,500? Yeah. And change. Taya, what do you think the mass would be if we hit the speed of light? What's happening as we go faster and faster to the mass? Is it getting bigger, smaller, or staying the same? What do you think the mass will be if you try going the speed of light? I'm looking for a word that starts with letter I. It's going to be infinite. This is why we can't get anything with matter up to the speed of light. Because its mass will become infinite. Even if it was a proton, its mass will become infinite. And do you know how much energy you need to get an infinite amount of mass to speed up? An infinite amount of energy. More energy than there is in the universe. This here is one of the big reasons why light is the cosmic speed limit. Oh, and this is also how we know that photons, which do travel at the speed of light, don't have mass. Because otherwise they couldn't travel at the speed of light. On your calculator? So that basically brings us to the end of the unit. Why is Einstein so revered? Well... We talk about his miracle year in 1905. He came out of nowhere. He had got his physics degree in university, but he was such an underwhelming student. He couldn't get a job teaching physics. He couldn't even get a job as a lab assistant. At age 26, you know, you're an adult, he was working in a patent office as a patent clerk. What was he doing? People were sending in inventions, and he was reading through their plans and deciding whether it will work. You get a patent. This won't work. We're not going to bother. And then all of a sudden, this person no one had heard of in the physics world in 1905 published not one, not two, not three, four extraordinary papers, each one of which would have won him a Nobel Prize. It's the most amazing year we've ever seen in science. Put your pencils down. Look up. As 1905 dawned, the soon to be 26 year old Albert Einstein faced life as a failed academic. Most physicists of the time would have scoffed at the idea that this minor civil servant could have much to contribute to science. Yet within the following year, Einstein would publish not one, not two, not three, but four extraordinary papers, each on a different topic, that were destined to radically transform our understanding of the universe. The myth that Einstein had failed math is just that. He had mastered calculus on his own by the age of 15, and done well at both his Munich Secondary School and at the Swiss Polytechnic, where he studied for a math and physics teaching diploma. But skipping classes to spend more time in the lab, 
don't skip classes. And neglecting to show proper deference to his professors. Always be nice to your teachers. Had derailed his intended career path. Passover even for a lab assistant position. He had to settle for a job at the Swiss patent office, obtained with the help of a friend's father. Working six days a week as a patent clerk, Einstein still managed to make some time for physics, discussing the latest work with a few close friends, and publishing a couple of minor papers. It came as a major surprise when in March 1905, he submitted a paper with a shocking hypothesis. So here's his first paper. In his first paper, and this is what he actually won his Nobel Prize for. He did not win a Nobel Prize for special relativity. In his first paper, he proved that photons exist. Photons are particles of light. At that time, it was believed that light was a wave. He showed it's also a particle. In fact, we now know that many things are both waves and particles at the same time. And he also, as part of this, this is where the idea of a laser comes from. This also explains why certain objects will glow in the dark when you expose them to light and certain objects won't. This explains why when you heat certain objects, they turn certain colors when you heat them up. Some will turn red hot, some won't. It's all part of something called the photoelectric effect. Despite decades of evidence that light was a wave, Einstein proposed that it could in fact be a particle, showing that the serious phenomena such as the photoelectric effect, could be explained by his hypothesis. The idea was derided for years to come, but Einstein was simply 20 years ahead of his time. Wave-particle duality was slated to become a cornerstone of the quantum revolution. Two months later, he... So two months later, he published another paper. Now he's just showing off. In the second paper, Jazz and Deep, he proved that atoms exist. Up until then, atoms were only theoretical. And because you couldn't see them, many scientists said, well, that's nice for the math, but there's no way something that small is real. He came up with a very clever mathematical argument and was able to prove that atoms are real. Is that fairly important to our current understanding of science? Yeah! May, Einstein submitted a second paper, this time tackling the centuries-old question of whether atoms actually exist. Though certain theories were built on the idea of invisible atoms, some prominent scientists still believed them to be a useful fiction rather than actual physical objects. But Einstein used an ingenious argument showing that the behavior of small particles randomly moving around in a liquid known as Brownian motion could be precisely predicted by the collisions of millions of invisible atoms. Experiments soon confirmed Einstein's model, and atomic skeptics threw in the towel. The third paper came in June. In June, so this, the atoms exist was in May. The third paper came at the end of June, basically two months, month and a half later. And this is the special relativity that I've been going through with you. This is where he showed that if the speed of light is a constant, weird stuff happens for time and mass and lengths. For a long time, Einstein had been troubled by an inconsistency between two fundamental principles of physics. The well-established principle of relativity, going all the way back to Galileo, stated that absolute motion could not be defined. Yet electromagnetic theory, also well-established, asserted that absolute motion did exist. The discrepancy, and his inability to resolve it, left Einstein in what he described as a state of psychic tension. But one day in May, after he had mulled over the puzzle with his friend Michel Besso, the clouds parted. Einstein realized that the contradiction could be resolved if it was the speed of light that remained constant, regardless of reference frame, while both time and space were relative to the observer. It took Einstein only a few weeks to work out the details and formulate what came to be known as special relativity. The theory not only shattered our previous understanding of reality, but would also pave the way for technologies ranging from particle accelerators to the global positioning system. One might think that this was enough, but in September, a fourth paper arrived. In September, Einstein had his final aha moment. As a consequence of special relativity, he was able to show that matter and energy are actually interchangeable. And he came up with maybe the most famous equation in history. You all know it. E equals MC. Now he's just showing off. All of these in one year. Folks, you with me back there? As a by-the-way follow-up to the special relativity paper, Einstein had thought a little bit more about his theory and realized it also implied that mass and energy 
one apparently solid and the other supposedly ethereal, were actually equivalent. And their relationship could be expressed in what was to become the most famous and consequential equation in history, E equals MC squared. Einstein would not become a world-famous icon for nearly another 15 years. It was only after his later general theory of relativity was confirmed in 1919 by measuring the bending of starlight during a solar eclipse that the press would turn him into a celebrity. But even if he had disappeared back into the patent office and accomplished nothing else after 1905, those four papers of his miracle year would have remained the gold standard of startling, unexpected genius. We'd never seen anything like that before, really, or since. Um, I, I'm okay, I can let you start the homework, or do you want to get weirder? Oh yeah. Okay. This is not on the test, but this is weirdly cool. Ryan, what's the speed of light? What's the speed of light? Actually, we've never measured the speed of light. Put your pencils down, look up. We're going to get very, very technical here, but this is also, I only learned about this a couple of years ago, and it's pretty good. <coughs> this video was sponsored by KiwiCo. More about KiwiCo at the end of the show. I know what you're thinking. Clickbait! No one has measured the speed of light? That's ridiculous. The speed of light is exactly 299,792,458 meters per second. We are so sure of it that since 1983, we've actually used the speed of light to define how long a meter is. It's just the distance light travels in a vacuum in 1 over 299,792,458 of a second. That definition ensures that the speed of light is exactly this number, no decimals. But hear me out. In this video, I will prove to you that light may never actually travel at this speed. And I can say that because no one has actually measured it. We can't measure the speed of light the same way we measure the speed of anything else. So this is a clip from the YouTube channel Smarter Every Day. A few years ago, Smarter Every Day built an air cannon that could fire a baseball, I think it was over a thousand miles per hour. It was well over supersonic. So this is their high speed video. I think we're recording everywhere. What are we doing? This is a video about measuring the speed of stuff. Okay. Tell me about how you measured the speed of the baseball fired out of your cannon. Well, to get the speed of the baseball, you need to know two things. You need to know the distance between two points, and you need to know the time that it takes the baseball to travel between those points. So basically, we took distance divided by time, and that's the speed of the baseball. And in our case, we were shooting with a high-speed camera, so you basically just count the frames. By the way, 469 meters per second. Could someone multiply that by 3.6? How many kilometers per hour did they get that baseball going? It was 460, I think 439 meters per second. Times by 3.6. Was it 439 or 469? I can't remember. Yeah, it, it was hauling. If you look at the video of the baseball, they actually lined up a bunch of baseball gloves in a row, and it punched through all of the gloves so fast. At one point, you actually see a brief puff of flame. That's how fast it's moving. It's a pretty spectacular video, but not related to this one. And then your clock is internal. Oh, you're going relativity. You're going to do something weird, aren't you? <laughs> you saw it coming. I can't believe oh, it. Oh, man. The thing I want to ask you about is the speed of light. Okay. Could you measure the speed of light like this? Imagine you have a laser that can fire a beam through a perfect vacuum for one kilometer. Start a timer the instant you fire the laser beam. And then exactly when it hits the end, stop the clock. Except, how do you know when light reaches one kilometer if you and the clock are at the starting point? Okay, so you need two clocks, one at the laser and one at the end, which stops automatically when it detects the laser light. But now, how do you make sure your two clocks are synchronized? Well, you could connect them via a wire and send a pulse from one to the other, 
but that pulse will travel at the speed of light, so it will arrive with a time delay. You might think you can just subtract that time delay, but it is equal to the time it takes for light to travel one kilometer. That's what we don't know and are trying to measure. So if you try doing it this way, you would need to know the speed of light in order to measure the speed of light. So that not, that's not going to work. Okay, new plan. Start with the clocks together and sync them up first, and then send one of the clocks down to the end. What's the problem with that method? That second clock moved, which means time dilated for it. Now you could calculate how much time dilated for it, but you know what you need in order to calculate? The speed of light, which is what you're trying to do an experiment to find. So you're using what you're trying to find in order to find what you're trying to find. So that's not going to work either. Now, what could possibly go wrong? Well, I'll tell you. The clock at the finish line was moving with respect to the one at the start, and special relativity tells us moving clocks tick slow relative to stationary observers. So by the time the clock reaches one kilometer, it will no longer be in sync with the clock at the start. Can I tell you the only solution to this problem? Ditch the second clock. Put a mirror at the end to reflect the light back, and use a single clock at the start to time the full two kilometer round trip. This is what we have done, but here's the problem. It's a round trip. So what does that mean? Wasn't this actually done before? He was on the mountain, and there's a wagon wheel with a lantern, and there's something like a mirror on the other side of the mountain. I've always wanted to do this. In 1845, a scientist did an experiment using 1845 technology to try and measure the speed of light, and it was really quite clever. Here's what he did. So, uh, that sounds a little like how the speed of light was first experimentally measured by Ibel Light Fizeau in 1849. He shot a beam of light between the teeth of a rapidly spinning gear to a mirror up on a hill eight kilometers away. And then by increasing the speed of the gear, he reached a point where the reflected light passed through the next gap on the gear, and so it was observed. And so by knowing how fast the gear was turning and how long he could make a good estimate as to how long it took to get back with 1845 technology. And this was his estimate for the speed so of light. So he measured the speed of light to be 313,000 kilometers per second, Close. which is within 5% of the presently accepted value. So someone has measured the speed of light. Or have they? What has been measured is the round trip or two-way speed of light. And now it's going to get weird. But no one has measured the one-way speed of light. One thing I'm going to throw at you, and I'm just going to, just going to come out and tell you. Here it is. It's like, what if the speed of light in this direction is different from the speed of light in this direction? Then that sounds like a Veritasium video. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, could you figure it out? The kind of crux of this problem is that the only way people have managed to measure the speed of light is for a round trip. No one's ever managed to measure the speed of light in just one direction. It's possible that the speed of light is half of C in one direction and then instantaneous on the return journey. What? That's, that's possible. Are you serious? Think about communicating with an astronaut stranded on Mars. Let's call him Mark. We send out a signal and get a response 20 minutes later. So we imagine our signal takes 10 minutes to get there and the reply takes 10 minutes to come back. But it's possible that our message took all 20 minutes to get there, and the reply came back instantaneously. There's no way we could tell the difference between these two scenarios. But why would the speed of light be different? Well, it's possible that there is some preferred direction through space-time. I mean, our universe has a lot of symmetries, but there's also some asymmetry. For example, why is there so much matter relative to antimatter? And physicists have worked out internally consistent theories of physics in which the speed of light is different forwards and in reverse. The speed of light could vary by just a few percent, up to at the extreme going C over 2 in one direction and infinitely fast in the other direction. Okay, so let me, let me figure this out. So, yeah, I, I kind of don't believe you. I kind of don't believe you. I don't believe you that light is a different speed in one direction but in the other, but I know you well enough to know that you wouldn't, you wouldn't call me and, and put a camera on me unless you knew you were right. And that's what scares me about this. <laughs> that scares me.
<laughs> now, you might think it is just simpler that light should travel at the same speed in all directions, but the truth is, that is a convention rather than an experimentally verified fact. Einstein himself pointed this out in his famous 1905 paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. He spends the first couple of pages on the problem of synchronizing clocks at different locations, A and B. And he says, there is no way that we can meaningfully compare the times they measure unless we establish by definition that the time required by light to travel from A to B equals the time it requires to travel from B to A. He's essentially defining that the speed of light in opposite directions is the same. And he puts by definition in italics to remind us that this is only a convention. It's known as the Einstein synchronization convention. So the idea that the speed of light is the same in opposite directions, as Einstein would later write, is neither a supposition nor a hypothesis about the physical nature of light, but a stipulation that I can make of my own free will to arrive at a definition of simultaneity. That sounds a lot more subjective than how I think most people would imagine the speed of light is defined. Dude, this is hardcore. <laughs> I've never thought about this. I didn't think about this before either. I always assumed that when we said the speed of light is C, we, we meant the one-way speed of light. There's no way to define the one-way speed of light. So the only thing we can really define is the two-way speed of light. Just look at the way Einstein defines C. It's for the round trip from A to B and back. I don't know if you saw in your physics classes, but whenever there was a light clock, it would always bounce the light up and then back. You would never see a light clock just bounce light one way. And this is why. The only thing we can be certain is constant for all inertial observers is the two-way speed of light. For over a hundred years, scientists have tried to find a way around this to measure the one-way speed of light by itself. Here is a paper published in the American Journal of Physics in 2009 that claims to measure the one-way speed of light. And here is a paper debunking this study, pointing out that these authors were actually measuring the two-way speed of light. But I'm imagining you might have some ideas for how to measure the one-way speed of light, so let's go through some of them. I mean, can't we just use a high-speed camera that shoots at a trillion frames a second so we can actually see light passing through an object? So I showed you a femto camera near the beginning of the year. Couldn't we use that? But the problem is the light is traveling from the femto camera, bouncing off the object, and coming back to the femto camera. That's the two-way speed of light, because it went there and back. The problem is you're not only seeing the light pass through the object, you're also seeing it bounce back to the camera measuring the two-way speed, not one-way. There you go. Get a spool of fiber optic cable, you know, I don't know, like 186,000 miles, and then and you could shine the light here, and you have the, the other end of the fiber here, and you could shine here, and then wait and see the delay, see if it's one second later over here. The thing is, like, that fiber's going around and around and around, so it could be that when the light goes this way over the top of the loop, it goes slower, and then when it goes on the bottom, it goes faster. You all average it out in the fiber, and you're, you're essentially getting lots of round trips in that fiber. So you're never getting a one-way. What if you center a synchronizing device between your two clocks and send out simultaneous pulses? Well, if the speed of light is the same in both directions, this perfectly synchronizes your clocks. But if the speed of light is different in each direction, one of the clocks will be ahead of the other and it will be ahead by just the right amount, so that when you measure the speed of light, you will find the value to be C, even though that was not the speed the light was traveling. This is the same reason GPS synchronized clocks won't work. The whole GPS system is based on the assumption that the speed of light is the same in all directions. If the speed of light is different in different directions, the light pulses from satellites will travel at different speeds, so the clocks won't be properly synced. By that I mean they will always measure C for the one-way speed of light, whether it is or isn't. How about starting with synchronized clocks in the middle and moving them apart with equal and opposite speeds? That way the time dilation for each clock will be the same and they'll still be synchronized when they reach the endpoints. But again, this only works if the speed of light in each direction is the same. If the speed of light depends on direction, then so does time dilation. You might think you could move the clocks really, really slowly so that time dilation is negligible. 
But if the speed of light is different in different directions, you can't just use the standard formula to calculate what that time dilation would be. I mean, it could be a lot worse than you think. So the reality is we're stuck. We need synchronized clocks to measure the one-way speed of light. But we need to know the one-way speed of light in order to synchronize our clocks. Now, this might sound like just an academic concern, so I want to go through an example to illustrate just how differently the universe works if the speed of light is not the same in all directions. So let's suppose we have an astronaut on Mars, and the speed of light isn't the same in both directions. What would happen? Let's say on Mars, Mark is trying to synchronize his clock with the Earth. At noon, Mission Control sends out a message that says, this signal was sent at exactly 12 o'clock. When Mark receives this message, he uses the Einstein synchronization convention to set his clock. He knows the round trip time delay is 20 minutes, so he assumes the signal must have taken 10 minutes to reach him. He programs his clock to 12.10 p.m. and sends a return message. This reply is sent at 12.10. The message is received on Earth at 12.20 p.m., so both parties know the synchronization was successful. When the clock reads 12.20 on Earth, it simultaneously reads 12.20 on Mars. But now consider what happens if the speed of light is not the same in both directions. Let's say it is C over 2 from Earth to Mars, and then instantaneous from Mars back to Earth. No one knows this, of course, so they continue to use the Einstein convention. The message is sent from Earth, but now it takes a full 20 minutes to reach Mars. But Mark doesn't know this. And as before, he assumes the signal took 10 minutes to reach him, so he sets his clock to 12.10 p.m., even though on Earth it is now 12.20. Mark then sends this reply sent at 12.10 p.m., which is instantaneously received on Earth at 12.20 Earth time. The experience for the two communicators is the same. The same messages were received with the same local time delays, but their clocks are out of sync by 10 minutes. What they think is the same moment for the other observer actually isn't. And there is no way they can ever recognize or correct this error. Imagine if someone on Earth immediately responded, how long did this message take to reach you? It's now 12.20. Well, the message would take 20 minutes to reach Mars, but due to the clocks being out of sync, it would arrive at 12.30 Mars time, so Mark would reply 10 minutes, a message that would instantaneously reach the Earth at 12.40 Earth time. The space-time diagram shows how there is flexibility in what you consider to be the same moment at two different locations, and in how you define the one-way speed of light. Einstein chose the convention where the one-way speed of light is always the same, but from an experimental perspective, any other convention is just as valid, up to and including one where the speed of light is C over 2 one way and instantaneous the other way. And in that case, it's interesting to think about what each observer is seeing when they look at the other. Mark would be seeing the Earth as it was 20 minutes ago, but Earth is seeing Mars in real time, exactly as it is right now. And this effect wouldn't stop at Mars. Look beyond it and you could see stars hundreds of light years away. Not as they looked centuries ago, but exactly as they are right this instant. One of the things is, you only know about that light when it reaches you. And you don't know anything about what journey it took to get to you. You just see it, and it's there. So, like, it's instantaneous. So an instantaneous interpretation of that light is just as good as one where it takes C to reach us. This is breaking my brain. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of unknowable, isn't it? It is unknowable. That's the whole point of the video is to say, we've all agreed, and this is based on something Einstein wrote in 1905, we've all agreed to just say, it's C in every direction. But the truth is, the physics works the same, whether it's C or the C over 2 and instantaneous, or anything in between. As long as the round trip works out to be C, none of physics breaks. And that's the crazy thing. So, so that's a deep dive into our current understanding of light speed. I'm going to pause the video.